<laughs> We're going to go to the tomb in search of Jesus from John, John's Gospel, chapter 20. And I want to welcome anybody who's visiting us here for the first time. You are welcome to worship with us. If you've coming here, after, haven't been here for a while, we want to welcome you back. If you're joining us on Zoom or on YouTube, we're glad that you're here and we hope that you're encouraged. Um, but we're going to read this old but familiar story, I'm sure, to many of you. From John's Gospel, chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the tomb had been removed from the entrance, that the stone, sorry, had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. And she said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple, that's John, by the way, Peter and the other disciple both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I love that, how John lets everybody know that he beat Peter to the tomb. He beat him in a race. I got there first. He bent over and then he looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him, in case you forgot, and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. And the cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first <laughs> also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the Scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary... Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him, and she cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told, them what she had, uh, that, all, she told him that he had said these things to her. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Eric, are you going to translate? Are you translating? Brilliant. Okay, so I'll speak a little slower. Is that all right? Will I speak slower today? So I've, I've preached a few Easter sermons now. And I've got to tell you, I always feel a degree of pressure on Easter, right? <laughs> As a preacher, if you ever want to knock it out of the park on a Sunday, it's on Easter, right? But how do we do that? How do we capture the significance of all that Easter is? How do I... In about 15 or 20 minutes, you're hoping it's 15, <laughs> comprehend the fullness of Easter. How do we do that? I was thinking about the gospel writers as they sat down to retell the story of Easter. The resurrection is pretty important stuff. It's big stuff. It's quite the task. But how did they capture the wonder of Easter? How do the gospel writers retell the details of the story whilst also revealing to us the significance of what Easter is. It's quite the task. But thankfully, they had the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen? <laughs> but I find it fascinating how Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, each in their own unique style, retell the resurrection story, making different points of emphasis. And John, whose gospel we're in this morning, he uses an interesting tactic when he retells the Easter story. John, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, 
Give us all the big, usual, kingdom-significant details. The stone was rolled away. Light has burst into the dark tomb. The clothes, the burial clothes, they're empty. Because death couldn't hold them. Amen? The tomb is empty because Christ has overcome the grave. Amen? The angel's testimony. Heaven has broken out on earth. John gives us all the big kingdom significant stuff. But then he does something that the other gospel writers don't do. John narrows the lens to Mary outside the tomb weeping. John gets personal. John narrows the lens to Mary outside the tomb weeping. John goes from the infinite fast pace rush to the tomb to this intimate moment. In the midst of all the resurrection wonder, John sort of slows the narrative down. And we get a personal encounter between Jesus and Mary Magdalene in the quiet and dew of the morning. And in fact, this is a, a tactic that John uses throughout his whole gospel. John has often given us these one-on-one, -on -one, quiet, intimate encounters with Jesus. There's Nathaniel in John 1. There's um, Nicodemus in the dead of the night. Sorry, not Nicodemus. Is it Nicodemus? Yes, it's Nicodemus. In John 3, a conversation between the two of them in the dead of night. There's the woman at the well in John 4, this intimate interaction around the well. There's the, the, at the pool of Bethsaida, when the, the blind man wants to be healed, there's this intimate moment between him and Jesus. Next week, Jesus will put his hands to Thomas, and Thomas will intimately touch Jesus' hands in this one-on-one -on -one exchange. When they're on the beach a few weeks later, Jesus will show up, he'll cook them breakfast, and he'll pull Peter aside. He'll say, Peter, do you love me? And again, they'll have that intimate exchange. John here, he narrows down the narrative for this personal exchange between Jesus and Mary. What's John up to with all these one-on-ones? Why does John get so personal? Well, I think John is showing us that Jesus cares personally for each one. Jesus cares personally for you. He cares for me. He cares for Nathaniel. He cares for Nicodemus. He cares for Mary. He cares for Lynn. He cares for Bev. He cares for Clara, for Marion. Jesus cares personally for each one. I've heard it said once that Jesus can only count in ones. <laughs> one sheep, one last coin, one prodigal son who returns. One, 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 one. Jesus only counts in ones. On Friday night, we were at the, the um, Good Friday service, and Tim and I, we stood about here, and we held the symbol of the bread and the blood, and each one came to receive the body and blood given for you, the body of blood given for you, the resurrected Lord who stands enthroned over the universe, stoops down for each one of us, seeks to bring transformative power of resurrection life to each one of us. Jesus invites each one of us to respond personally, to know and to be in relationship with him. Jesus gets personal, and he meets us where we're at. And he meets Mary outside the tomb, and she's weeping. And the reason for Mary's tears are legion. <laughs> many. The source of Mary's tears are many. Mary Magdalene, of course, in her own story, was a woman on the outside until Jesus restored her. But she thinks he's gone now. Mary weeps. Mary cries because she's come to the tomb of her friend and rabbi, and it looks like it's been tampered with. Could you imagine if you went to the tomb of one of your loved ones or the grave of one of your loved ones and the stone was knocked over, the soil all upturned? You'd be absolutely devastated. Who would do such a thing? 
Did Jesus not experience enough in life that now they can't even leave him alone in death? She's devastated. Mary weeps. But most of all, Mary weeps because the lingering images of Good Friday are still fresh in her mind. When her friend and Savior, Jesus, was falsely accused and brutally crucified on a Roman cross. It's all too much for Mary. Mary weeps. And more wiser folks than I have said that Mary's tears at the tomb represent the tears of all of us. That Mary's tears at the tomb are the tears of all of those who have wept at the cruelty and violence and disorder of our world. That Mary's tears at the tomb are at one with all the tears we cry for the loved ones that we've lost. And many of us know the reality of that this week. Outside the tomb, Mary weeps. But she weeps our tears right where they belong. Outside the empty tomb. Because it's here where hope dawns. Amen? Jesus' voice breaks in to Mary's weeping. Woman, why are you crying? Now, if in your head you hear, woman, stop your whinging. Or woman, why are you being so emotional? If you hear that in your head, you're listening wrong, okay? Jesus cares about each one, remember. Jesus gets personal. Woman, Why are you crying is a question of genuine concern. It's almost as if to say, tell me your griefs. Tell me why you're hurting. Let me know what's going on. Woman, why are you crying? But Mary, she's still caught in the fog of grief. That happens sometimes. Can't see Jesus right next to us when grief surrounds us. But Jesus gets even more personal. Told you he gets personal. (laughs) He calls her by name. Miriam, in Aramaic. Mary, Mary, I'm here. Just like Jesus called um, Lazarus out of the tomb. Lazarus! Just like Jesus called Zacchaeus down from the tree. Zacchaeus! Just like Jesus called Simon Peter off the boat. Jesus calls Mary out of her grief. Miriam. And he wakes her up. There's an old prophecy from Isaiah who says, Don't be afraid, says the Lord, for I have redeemed you and I've called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not get burned. For I am the Lord your God, your Savior. When I was younger and I learned how to write and read my name, I thought it was a great thing that I could open up the Bible and look through the table of contents, and I couldn't read any other names. (laughs) L-U-K-E. Hey, that's my name. And I'd sit in the service, and I wouldn't know anything else or really care all that much of what's going on, but if I had a Bible, I'd find my name. There I am. (laughs) Luke. You know, if we look close enough, all of our names are in there. Not literally, (laughs) we're in the stories, we're in the loss, we're in the grief, we're in the sin, we're in the redemption, we're in the renewal, we're in the restoration. All of us, all of our names are in there, friends. Jesus gets personal. He calls Mary by name. And he calls your name too. He calls us out of whatever griefs and pains and struggle gather around us. Today, Miriam, Miriam, and Mary, she sees Jesus, and she cries, says the text, but not tears of sorrow. She cries in joy, Rabboni. Her mourning has been turned to rejoicing almost. Rabboni, and she throws her arms around Jesus. Jesus' voice meets Mary in her pain. Jesus' presence comforts Mary beyond measure. 
Jesus' resurrection gives Mary full and abundant salvation. He's done it. Jesus gets personal. And he says, don't hold on to me. Because I imagine her wrapped around from pretty tight, wouldn't you? He says, don't hold on to me, Mary. Go and tell the others. Go and tell the lads. I'm ascending to my father and to your father. Notice the personal possession pronoun of that. I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Because of what Jesus has done in overcoming death, the Father is now accessible to the world. Not just my Father anymore, friends. He's yours, says Jesus. This is for you. You're f- What's John say at the start of his gospel? Uh, that you might become children of God. This is why Jesus came. And now at the end of the gospel, when the resurrection has happened, I am going to my Father and to your Father. You are now children of God because of what I have done. And Mary becomes the first apostle, the first messenger of the good news of the resurrection. I have seen the Lord. He is risen. And the glorious light of Easter dawns on Mary, and she's sent out rejoicing. And I love it. Because the resurrection is for the whole world, yet John, he gives us this one example, (laughs) this one personal encounter of Easter dawning on Mary. Mary, in a way, becomes the first of all of us who will be transformed by the wonderful light of Easter. John, he keeps it personal. And again, I think John is showing us that the wonder of Easter It shines brightest, not in my preaching. (laughs) It shines brightest when it dawns in one's heart. That's when Easter is at its most best. The beauty of Easter really sings when it takes root in one's life, when it transforms somebody from death to life. When one beholds the light of the resurrected Lord, believes and goes and tells everybody, hey, you'll never guess what I found. (laughs) You'll never guess the new life I have in Jesus. That's when we capture the wonder and the marvel of Easter. Easter shines brightest when its hope brims and blossoms in the lives of individuals, when Easter matters for you and for me. And that's why we've gathered here this morning, right? A few years ago, I was a pastoral intern at a church in in Granville, Michigan. And I wanted to get in the senior pastor's good books and so when he asked me, hey, will you lead the sunrise service on Easter? It was my first year there. I said, sure, I'll do it. I said, when is it? He said, 6 a.m. I said, that's okay. I said, where is it? He said, in the graveyard. I said, come again? <laughs> he said, the graveyard. Okay. Didn't want to make a scene. <laughs> so at 6 a.m. on Easter Sunday morning, my first Sunday at this church, it wasn't far from my house, so I threw my guitar over my shoulder. The birds were singing. I had my Bible under my arm, and I went to the graveyard. And when I got there, all the church family was pottering about. Some of them were fixing flowers on graves. Others were standing close to a grave, looking and reading the words on a tombstone. Others were up real close, sort of rubbing their fingers off the letters engraved on all the stones. And I realized that these are the graves of their loved ones. Granddads, moms, sons, daughters, friends, saints, all their griefs and losses were all in this graveyard. Yet we gathered in the center of that graveyard And we proclaimed, like Ethan has already done this morning, the words of Jesus, I am the resurrection and the life. And we clung to that promise. And we sang, over death he has conquered. Hallelujah, he has conquered. And as the sun rose over the tombs, as we worshipped the resurrected Lord, the hope and the promise of Easter burst out of each one of us. And that's when Easter's at its best, when it matters in our real lives. 
Jesus gets personal. And Jesus' desire is that each one of us would know the full, abundant life that He gives us. Jesus calls our name in the midst of all of our gardens of fear and grief and pain and loss, drawing us into His loving embrace. And Jesus, by His grace and His mercy, makes all this possible by His life, His death, and His glorious resurrection. And He gives it. You know who He gives it to? To you, and to you, and to you, and to each one who come to receive. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, may you enter once again into the tombs of our hearts this morning. Lord, may you spark new life into each one of us. May the good news of the risen Lord dawn afresh on us today. Lord, may the promise of eternal life that we may experience even this day be real for us. Make it so in our hearts, we pray. Lord, I pray that you would help us to receive your grace. Lord, maybe we don't feel good enough this morning. Maybe the pain is too heavy. The reality of life is stinging just a little bit too much today. But Lord, I ask that your Spirit, by its power and its mystery and its wisdom, would weave your redemptive hope into the depths of our souls this day. Wake up, O sleeper. Come to life in Jesus Christ, we pray. In his powerful and risen name, all God's people said, Amen.